that God has I'm sorry, we have no doubt that God has a message in store for us. We have been looking at this morning, um, let me just back up. So today, being the fourth Sabbath of August, we have been celebrating End It Now. And this is, this is, this is an emphasis that the world church the World Church Brethren, so not just Perrine and Mission Station and Coconut Grove and the churches in South Florida are placing emphasis on today, but the World Church placing an emphasis on end it now. And what is end it now? What are we trying to end up? What are, what are we trying to end, brethren? Views in all forms, shapes, and sizes, because we know it comes in all forms shapes and sizes and so this evening we are here with our sister churches collaborating this afternoon's program in the form of panel discussion to look at abuse and abuse in the sense of ensuring that our leaders in our midst in our in our institutions churches and school how do we deal with abuse, brethren? This is something that not has it only been affecting our, you know, those churches you hear about in the news, but believe it or not, it's right here in our Seventh-day Adventist church. And so this afternoon, not just with the family life ministries of the church, but we have co-sponsoring ministries such as the children's family, education, health, the ministerial and the youth ministries all coordinating with the women's ministries and brethren we can see the importance of having all of these ministries coming together to place emphasis to let us all be aware of abuse and how we can prevent it so this year's focus is of course the title you have heard it wolves in sheep clothing and specifically this 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 evening we will be having a panel discussion brethren this morning for those of you online and in the sanctuary pastor took us um back into into the story of mary magdalene and of course the topic of his sermon was the encounter and i'm sure when you hear the encounter we can think far and wide this evening's presentation of course as i said is in collaboration with all our sister churches mission station coconut grove kendall i'm absolutely sure we have homestead church online and brethren from far and wide connecting with us on our program this evening just to to be aware become aware of abuse so this evening i'm not going to be speaking much longer let me just say welcome again it's great to have you in the sanctuary and online we thank you very much for taking the time to be with us here at Perrine. pastor is in our midst thank you pastor and at this time i'm going to call up on our own brother hans and i said own brother hans because brethren his his son is in our children's ministry he does everything with us goes everywhere with us but he is in person with us today he is here representing mission station and he is going to introduce us to the host moderator of this evening's program god bless you brethren allow the holy spirit to use us this afternoon so we can look and see the effect and come up with solutions as to how we can prevent abuse in our midst. Thank you. Blessing. Thank you, Sister Castell. Good afternoon. Happy Sabbath, everyone. I know this is going to be a great program this evening, so I don't want to take up much time. I'm going to introduce the host. She wrote to me what she kind of wanted to say. Uh, she's being modest. She just put Magdalia Brathwaite, but she's actually a doctor, Magdalia Brathwaite. She's a behavioral health professional, director of a behavioral health treatment program at the Virgin Islands Department of Health. The most important work to her is her ministry as a forgiveness facilitator. 
and educator. She seeks to eradicate forgiveness, illiteracy, and feels that this work is a life imperative. And from a personal note, we met uh, Dr. Magdalene Brathwaite during the pandemic. She has been a tremendous blessing to the Mission Station family. She has a way with words. I know uh, you guys see her or she he joins the book club every Sunday morning, but she has a way with words. And with that being said, last night program was wonderful with the youth. That host did a wonderful job, but uh, I'm going to give my props to my Magdalene of Brathwaite. Amen. So, brethren, I just want to let you know that because we're on Zoom, in the event you, you have contributions in terms of comments or questions, the elder is asking that you come up front since we're on Zoom so that you can ask those questions or make your comments. Thank you so very much. We'll now turn it over to Sister Magdalia. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you for that. Thank you for that, Hans. Um, are you all able to see the slide? Wolf and Sheep's Clothing. Can you see the slide? No, I'm not seeing it. No, okay, thank you. All right, let's try again. <clears throat> Okay, are we able to see it now? Yes, it's sharing now. All right, great. Thank you so much for um, having me here today. Uh, I am very excited to be here to talk about this really important topic. Um, and <clears throat> we have a wonderful panel and they'll be introducing themselves to you shortly. Um, so this is called Wolves in Sheep's Clothing. Um, and it's based on Matthew 7, verse 15, where it says, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. Now, when I first heard of the topic wolf in sheep's clothing, I have to say, this is how I felt about it. I felt like if we could get rid of that topic, although that's something that they choose to call it. I would get rid of it. Why would I get rid of it? Because the truth is that if we're out there looking for wolves, we're going to miss the sheep that are sitting right next to us that are that need our support in this matter. And it's a very important matter. Um, and so if I were to name it, I would call it hidden in plain sight, hidden in plain sight. Now, this issue that we're dealing with, it is a very sensitive issue. And it is not a new issue. We see that in 1005 uh, to, to um, 965 BC, the story of David and his challenges with Bathsheba. And <clears throat> in uh, World War II in the 1940s, uh, when we were having the Southeast Asia War, many women were rounded up from their villages to go to war with men to be comfort women. And then in 1988, we see Jimmy Swaggart, who also had challenges with indiscretion that rippled through his church. In 1998, of course, the highest office in this uh, nation was also ripped through with the scandal of President Clinton and Monica Lewinsky. So this issue is global. This issue is in our churches, in our schools. It's even in our homes. And it is an extremely sensitive topic. And so we have to think about what we're feeling as we talk about this topic, because there's judgment that we can feel as we talk about it, shame, blame, we can feel pain. We can also feel disdain and anger and regret and revenge and also wanting to repay those who have behaved in this most difficult and inappropriate manner. <clears throat> but I just want right from the beginning to give you some resources that you can use 
if this is triggering to you, because it is a very, very challenging topic. So please feel free to take a picture of the slide and um, we will also share this with you towards the end of our time together. Now, the Bible tells us that we are gonna have trouble in this world. And truth be told, this topic is trouble. And I thank the End It Now um, at the general conference level that has been bringing this to our attention year after year, because as Seventh-day Adventists, we are not immune to this challenge, right? So let's jump right in because I want to talk about what sexual grooming is. Please feel free to take a picture of this slide as I will just read this in your hearing. So what is sexual grooming? It's when an individual builds a relationship with an adult or child to abuse and exploit them. They build trust with them, then control, isolate, abuse emotionally, physically, and sexually. Now the groomers come off as friendly and charming and supportive and kind at first. And then it's easy for the person that they're grooming to lower their guard. And then sometimes they'll use threats and violence and other kinds of coercion to get people to engage in physical activity, uh, sexual activity that they had not planned for. And they target underage children, vulnerable teenagers and adults. Now in today's topic, we're going to be focusing on the story of Sarah, who is a child, but I really want us to look at this issue from a larger perspective. I'd like us to look at this issue from the perspective of the fact that everyone is a potential target of this. And so the devil would have it in, in no other way. And so again, it may seem like a harmless friendship with adults, but be wise, be wise as a serpent, right? And harmless as a dove. Groomers build trust and they gain access into your daily lives. How was your day? And they can begin to, to, to show caring in a way that people that are having a hard time may be open to. And so I think it's important to recognize that the flattering words, the promises, and their actions to win you over all come with an agenda. All right. So I want to say that when we think about the grooming process, oftentimes we think about the grooming process with the person that is perpetrating, but we don't really look at what the grooming process is that is happening to the perpetrator. And so there is a process that's happening with the perpetrator that I feel in my in my imagination of this is that it looks something like this, that they're being puppeteered to think in a certain way. And then that thinking expands to now puppeteering someone else in a way that they don't really want to participate in or may participate in and not necessarily have planned on participating in. And ultimately, who is the great puppeteer of this whole grooming process? Well, the enemy is of the person that is being perpetrated against and the perpetrator. So I'm going to read in your hearing Sarah's diary. Now, I must say that <clears throat> this is quite a lengthy story. Uh, and I would like someone, if you can, to put uh, the story in the chat so that you may look at it uh, and listen to the reading of it in your leisure. What I have taken the liberty of doing today is uh, pulling out salient parts of the story that I will read in your hearing. So it starts with Sarah, who is a 14-year-old girl who has returned to a Seventh-day Adventist school who had been uh, in the school in her much earlier years, and her father didn't want to pay for her to continue to go to school. But he has um, decided that he would pay for her to go to the school, and both she and her mother feel like that's why his business is being blessed, because he is going through this process of ensuring his daughter's education and safety and spiritual growth in a Seventh-day Adventist school. So she starts off by saying that Mr. M, he teaches most of her classes and his wife teaches other ones. And Mr. M teases me sometimes by stepping on my toes or spanking me with a ping pong paddle when we are in teams of foursies. He's gentle and it's just his way of saying hi. Now, 
she's writing this to her diary sometimes and to the Lord sometimes. So she says to the Lord in her diary, now I need your help again. I think I'm getting a crush on Mr. M. How else am I supposed to feel when he looks at me the way that he does? It's kind of how Ronnie, her crush, looks at me, but it's way more. I don't know, but I can't stop thinking about him. And he's so handsome. Mr. M told mom that I was mature and the other more mature than the other kids and really good at typing and organizing things. And he asked if he could hire me to help him in his office after school on Mondays. She said, of course I can help him, but he wouldn't need to pay me. I'll just volunteer. Did I say I'm excited? Now the new school year has started and he says that she's doing a really good job at being his secretary, that it's something special between us that is causing me trouble. When I was in the little copy room, he came in and closed the door and came up and put his arms around my waist from behind and gave me a long hug. Mr. M gave me a, a hug from the back around my waist. And then he turned me around and he gave me a full hug for a long time. And he had given me side hugs before, but this hug was different. I can't describe how I felt. Beautiful feelings just washed over me. Then she says that Mr. M began to call her mid, M-I-D, which means my impossible dream after an old song that he taught us in the choir. He, he, he gives initials to the little notes that he writes as L-Y-T, your love you tiger. Isn't that the sweetest? We got some alone time as usual after school today. And we had such a nice time on the couch in his office, hugging and kissing and talking. I love it when he plays with my hair like that. Anyway, we're, anyway we were getting really snuggly and all of a sudden he pulled away and said, I had the surgery, but it didn't take away my desire. He sounded all upset and left. Today, Mr. M took me to a new place for the hugging. My mom and some of her friends were at the school setting up for a rummage sale in the gym. So we needed to be more careful than usual. He took me into the janitor's closet that had a little stairway and he was more under my clothes than usual. In the darkness, he made me lie down. I wasn't sure what was happening and it hurt. He said, thank you, but he didn't need to because of course, I'm glad to make him happy. Later, he said he'd been worrying about me all afternoon and wanted to know if I was okay. And I said, of course I was okay, but I didn't tell him about the blood. He calls it lovemaking. And since then, he's made love to me at least once a week, usually on Mondays when I stay late to work. It doesn't hurt anymore and it's wonderful. Sometimes when Mr. M wants to be alone with me. He gives the class an assignment and says, Sarah, please meet me in the office. I have something for you to do for me. Since I'm his secretary, no one thinks anything about this. And we can go off to the biology lab or somewhere and be lovers. He's so clever. Mr. M had a serious talk with me before I left school today. He dismissed the class a little early and called me into his office. He said he loves me. And if any, and if he had known this ahead of time, he would have waited to get married so he could marry me. But it's Friday. He has special responsibilities at the church this weekend, and it's making him feel really guilty and about being unfaithful to his wife. Mr. M had been sitting a couple of rows behind me in church, and he said the way that the light came in through the window and shone in my hair was so beautiful that he couldn't wait until Monday to be with me again. I came to school prepared for us to be good, but he said he couldn't resist me. Honestly, I was a little disappointed because even though I was heartbroken about it, I did have sweet peace about breaking up, but the school year will end and we'll never be together again. 
We did talk more about the possibility of getting caught. And he said, if anyone found out what we were doing, my dad would shoot him. Daddy does have a gun, so I am thinking about this. I'd never even considered telling anyone about our love, but now for sure I won't because I don't want Mr. M to be killed and I don't want daddy to go to prison for murder all because of me. I didn't mean to cause all this trouble. I must try to help Mr. M be more careful. Maybe I should go back to fixing my hair the old way and stop wearing the blue dress. This week had been a little rough. On Sunday, Mr. M rode his motorcycle over to our house and after visiting with my dad for a bit, he offered me a ride. My parents didn't say anything, so I went. We had such a beautiful time together in the hills above my house. Later, my dad got after me for going off like that with a married man. He said, it didn't look good. Well, I was just glad he didn't say anything to Mr. M. That would have been awful. Then a couple of days later, I caught my mother with, with my purse. It was open and I had written a love poem to Mr. M and it was in there. She might have seen it because she looked upset. She didn't say anything. Oof. I know I have no right to complain, but I just hate it when Mr. M is all lovey-dovey with his wife. Anyone, everyone thinks they're so adorable and that is so cute. Well, it makes me sick. How can he be like that with his wife when he's in love with me? I love Mr. M so much. I wish I could marry him. I won't be old enough to get married for a while. Maybe by the time I am, Miss M will get cancer or something, and then he'll and then he and I can be together. His kids adore me, so that would be okay. I can't imagine ever loving or marrying anyone else. Would it be okay if I got married to someone else? I don't know. Is he tied to me for life? Since I've been having sex with him, am I tied to him for life? It's so confusing. Years now have passed and, and Sarah continues to write in her diary during college. Here I am in college my first year, and today I finally had the opportunity to talk to someone. I've been having so much trouble with my English that the professor sent me to a counselor. I so wanted to tell him all about Mr. M. I think he would have understood, but my loyalty was still too strong and my shame too fresh and too great, and I couldn't do it. The thing is, Mr. M was on campus two weeks ago to recruit teachers. That's how it goes. Just when I'm making progress and getting on with my life, he calls or writes or even comes to see me. He moved away from my hometown and encourages me to date guys. But how can I date anyone when we're still in touch sometimes? And if he loves me so much as he says he does, how can he tell me to date? It's just weird. He says that even though we have to break up as lovers, our friendship is too special to give up and that his life is richer and better with me in it. I can't live with you, but I can't live without you, he says. It's so nice to be adored. I may be an adult now, but my ability to tell him is the same as it was in the beginning. He always calls me later to say sorry, which I know is the right thing for him to do, but honestly, I just hate it. Will somebody someday love me who doesn't have to apologize for it? I tried calling him by his first name once. I'm glad that he can continue teaching and being a principal, but I know he has struggled in his career and I know it's all my fault. You know, Lord, you have not been able to bless him with all that has happened between us. Thank you that at least nobody found out about us and he didn't lose his teaching, ministry, and marriage. Maybe finally he'll move on from us and will make it easier for me to move on as well. And so here we have the story of Sarah's diary. And while you're processing what you're feeling, I just want you to take one minute and think this is a young girl in your church, in our schools, and maybe even in your home. And this is happening not just globally, not just in Florida, but it's happening in our churches across the country. 
So today we have a panel that will be sharing their thoughts with us. And I am going to ask the panel to introduce themselves uh, as they will be leading the discussion today. But I think it's really important for us to understand that although we have a panel that's going to be leading in our discussion today, we really wanna hear the voices of everyone. This is an issue where every voice matters. And so we are going to allow the panel to share, but we also wanna hear from you. And so we'd like you to put your comments in the chat. We'd like you to put your questions in the chat. And we'd like you also to raise your hands and um, participate in the conversation about this very important topic. So I'm gonna ask the panel to introduce themselves, starting with Brother Sheppy. Well, good good afternoon. My name is Courtney Shippey and I serve as an elder at the Palm Spring Seventh-day Adventist Church in Lake Worth, Florida. And I'm very happy to be here, being a part of this conversation, not because it's such a, a, a wonderful topic, but because it's such an important topic. Yes. I, I, I worked um, in a former life. I administered childcare licensing in one of our Florida counties. So the whole issue of child abuse and neglect is, um, is, is quite a, a challenge. Um, and it's, 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 it's very pervasive, it's all over. And so um, I hope to be able to add a few per, uh, a per perspective to the discussions. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Amanda? Good afternoon. My name is Amanda Samuels. I am a therapist in the South Florida area for the past 22 years. Um, my demographics are children, adolescents, and adults. I am very heartened that this topic is being discussed finally in an open forum where we can learn from one another, we can help each other out, and we can provide the resources to get the help that we so desperately need. I look forward to learning, I look forward to sharing, and I look forward to discussing. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Sergeant Barry. Good afternoon, happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Um, thank you for inviting me into the discussion as well. I have um, been working with the Miami-Dade Police Department. I'm a sergeant there, I've been on for 20 years. Um, worked in several roles, including domestic crimes and missing persons where we dealt with um, missing and exploited children and the abuses that we see um, in those various areas. I am a member of the Perrine Church, and um, I'm happy that we are uh, having this discussion this evening. It's an important one, and one that we need to continue beyond this point. Thank you so much. Pastor Benoit? Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Edley, Edley Benoit. I am uh, the pastor here of the Perrine Seventh-day Adventist Church. Um, extremely excited to be a member of this um, illustrious panel. Um, this is an extremely important subject. Um, uh, the joy that I'm feeling right now is that we're actually having this conversation and I think it's uh, long overdue. Um, I have dealt with uh, family issues for many, many years, uh, both as an attorney, my doctoral program is also in uh, family. Um, and I have seen a lot that uh, sometimes I wish I could forget. Uh, mm. But it's our reality and uh, that we are having this discussion is something that uh, I'm extremely proud of our church for doing so. Thank you so much, Pastor. Um, so <clears throat> let's go back to thinking about this experience that Sarah shared in her diary. And um, let's shape the conversation by really trying to understand what was the impact of this experience on the lives of Sarah and Mr. M. 
What was the impact of this experience on their lives? So I'm going to I'm going to ask the panel to um, try to answer that question if they can, and then if there are other um, comments or questions, please feel free to raise your hand or put them in the chat. I believe that Sarah's life was impacted. First of all, her innocence was taken from her. Um, the grooming process uh, started uh, at, a, at a young age. There are multiple um, implications in her entire story. It affected Mr. M's uh, life, ma marital life, his experience. It also um, impacted his ability to truly be the Christian leader that he should have been uh, for Sarah. Um, and also it had implications in the fact that he befriended her father who was not a believer from what I understand. And so therein is another um, missed opportunity to introduce Christ um, mm -hmm. in, in the situation. So it, it had, spiritual um, impact, physical, mental, emotional, uh, environmental uh, impacts. It, it, it's, um, it's, a, it's a very sad, uh, but unfortunately a common story. Yes, yes. Thank you for that. It is a sad and common story. Yet Sarah thought that she was in love and that she was being loved. And I think that sometimes the grooming process can, can feel like that. It can feel as though the special bond as he started framing it was something that was growing between them that was beyond his control. Anyone else, what is the deeper impact that this had on both Sarah and Mr. M? Hi, it's Amanda. If I may get, um, give a different perspective. Absolutely. Um, this is sort of a, a, a backdrop. Mm -hmm. I think Mr. M was done a great disservice mm -hmm. by Sarah not reporting it. Mm -hmm. And I think that disservice was done prior to him grooming her. The fact mm -hmm. that his approach was so skilled mm -hmm. and so precise, it's safe to assume that he had done this before. Yes. This may, this may not have been his first victim. This mm -hmm. may not have been his first conquest. And the fact that Sarah did not report it because she thought she was in love and, and that shows her vulnerability and her, her immaturity and her Pollyanna-ness, um, it didn't help him. Obviously it didn't help Sarah, but I suspect because we work in the field and we know that this is, these are usually serial rapists, and serial perpetrators, I think that there's another Sarah out there that we probably will not hear of. So his the impact to him is that he has gotten comfortable mm -hmm. with his behavior. Sarah is trying to rebuild her life and felt this sense of loyalty to him, which is usually what happens. And so Sarah's impact is that that's going to flare up at some point in her life, maybe when she gets married, when she has a daughter, and for Mr. M, the fact that he's not stopped means that he thinks that he has mastered this, and he obviously has become very adept at this. So this will continue. Thank you so much, Amanda, for that. And um, you're absolutely correct that his skill in the area does say that he has had some experience before. Um, and I think that one of the things that's important about this story too is the misrepresentation of love to a child. Um, first she has this crush on Ronnie, her her school, her school, her school crush, and all of a sudden, love becomes something that you have to hide. And that is a misrepresentation of of God and his love. Love is not supposed to be hidden. Love is something that needs to live in the light. And that is one of the misrepresentations that happened in this story. Anyone else? Anyone else? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 
Mm -hmm. I'd like to 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 point to the fact that this happens within an institution. Yes. And it was a prolonged event. It it occurred repeatedly. His wife worked in the same institution. Now, there are institutional safeguards that are put in place for a reason to, to help to prevent this kind of thing. Certain basic things like the two adult policy when interacting with children, that you need to have two adults when, especially in the church, well, the school, um, in principal's office, says, I know at my church, when my pastor got there, the first thing he did was got a, a, a glass pane put in the door so that, you, you, you know, there was, there was no opportunity for the appearance of impropriety. So anyone could look through and see, but not here. Uh -huh. So these, these are some of the, the, the things, the, the proper, when well, the screening would not pick up a principal, the regular background screening that's required, but it probably would pick up someone else who would want to do that same type of um, behavior. And, you know, we have the six, six month waiting period for new members. All those are, and then the most important thing is the parenting. It, this is not, um, you know, beating the victim, but the parenting is very, very important because if Sarah could confide all these wonderful, wonderful, quote unquote, wonderful things that she was experienced and that she documented in her diary, if she could confide these things to her parents, if she could tell her parents how wonderful this man was and the things that he had, was doing, then perhaps they would be able to see that something wrong was taking place. So, so th those are some of the things, the, the parenting uh, the, and, and this program, you know, the awareness that it brings and parenting training and um, specific and general um, consent for children to, to participate in various activities is very, very important in, in, in helping to prevent this kind of thing. Thank you. Thank you. If I can I just jump in there really quick. Yes, please. A, a lot of what um, the original question was, how was Sarah and Mr. M impacted by this? Yes. That question in many ways has already been answered. However, I just want to add that the impact is not just limited to Sarah and Mr. M. Um, That's right. Talking about for generations to come, unless it is properly addressed, Sarah uh, and her offsprings will be impacted by this, you know, period of indiscretion that happened between her and this grown man who, as uh, it was already mentioned, seemed to be very skilled at what he did. Now, yeah. there's a lot of what happened between Sarah and Mr. M that happened in the shadows. What made it possible was the T word, which happened in broad daylight. A yeah. lot of it was done in the open because right. of trust. He was awesome enough to know that even before befriending Sarah, he had a wonderful relationship with her parents, giving him or giving Sarah um, the, uh, the opportunity to 
even not even question the initial you know impact the initial uh, interaction that she had with him because mom and dad is cool with it if i can use that term except mom and dad is not cool with what was happening mom and dad was cool with what they thought mr m was doing but mr m was on a completely different level so uh you know that's why i spoke in my sermon this morning while trust matters and i want every single person here to trust me as the leader of their church there are certain things that it's okay if you don't trust me with uh -huh. it comes to your children making sure that my interaction with your children need at all times irrespective of my title to be monitored because we have too many evidence of how trust is abused no. and therefore we cannot take that risk Yes, um, I completely agree with you that it was an issue where trust was um, misappropriated. Um, at the same time, the next question that I, that was going to be on the table, but I think we're already sort of touching it, is were there other victims, were there other uh, people that experienced the collateral damage of this other than Mr. M and um, Sarah. And as the pastor said, yes, it's generational. But in the interim, the school was, was experiencing it because Mr. M, the Bible says a double-minded man is what? Is unstable in all of his ways. What that says to me is that Mr. M was not as effective of a principal as he could have been or as a leader in that school. And so all of the children in the school, they were also victims of this. They also experienced the damage that this could cause. Certainly in his marriage, the Bible says an adulterous man um, runs when no one is chasing him, right? So we know that his marriage was also being challenged here. And and the way that you relate to people when you um, are in a situation where suspicion and hiding become the norm for your lives, it begins to take a toll on your health and on the way that you interact with other people. So this actually has such ripples throughout society and throughout our churches and our homes and in our schools. And so who also are uh, victims of this? All of us. In fact, just hearing Sarah's story causes us all to experience some victimization. <clears throat> and so let's talk about this from a biblical perspective. So we know the story in 2 Samuel of Amnon and his sister Tamar, 2 Samuel 13. And so how does this story, with the backdrop of Sarah and Mr. M's story, how does this story have modern day implications? Here we see a brother who is burning so much for sexual connection with his sister that he puts her in a place that damages her, his family. Um, so can we, can we talk about that? Can we draw some lines between why the Lord even allowed this to be in the scriptures and the subject that we're talking about today. Where do we see the implications of that in modern day times? Anyone? So while you're thinking, let me just say that one of the things that I'm struck by in that story is that he was so focused that he thought something was literally wrong with him, right? He, he, the, his servant went to him and said, why are you so downcast? What's wrong with you? And then he shared with him what was happening. And so if we think about Mr. M, if we think about the mind of a perpetrator, is what they're doing something that they're trying to do to get past something that they're feeling in the moment, hoping that they won't do it again? Certainly, we don't exactly know the mind of a perpetrator. But what I'm saying is the depth, the drama, the difficulty, the challenge of that story still ripples through our lives today. And I think it's important that the Lord put it in the Bible for us to focus on and learn from. Anyone? Anyway. 
Any thoughts about how that is connected with the topic that we're talking about today? Any thoughts, comments? Now, now, Doc, I think you mentioned sometime in your introduction that we, we need to be mindful of the fact that uh, perpetrators are often victims themselves. And I think exactly. I yes. Um, you, you have to ask yourself the question, how much, and, I, and I'm not scapegoating anyone, right? But mm -hmm. how much control does the perpetrator have over the desires that they have at that moment? that they become so uh, focused mm -hmm. on achieving their goal that mm -hmm. they cannot see anything wrong yeah. with what they're doing until they get to their you know, objective, they mm -hmm. accomplish their objective. And here's the reality, because I have, there's one person in particular that I have counseled with that you know, while it was not a sister per se, it was just mind boggling to me to see the, the, the infatuation that the person had over achieving that specific goal and in the process as mm -hmm. they were sending it back to me, they could not understand that there was anything wrong with what they were trying to do. There's something twisted there whereby we need to turn around and while we call sin, sin, we call wrong, wrong, but we have to ask ourselves how victimized is the, vic is, is the perpetrator himself? Uh -huh. So I do agree with that. And that, that, that is the purpose of making this connection to recognize that this, everyone that's involved in this is a victim. And, and so it's important because it's so easy to judge the person who is perpetrating. It's so easy for us to look at him as the wolf and not to recognize that the enemy is attacking the way that his mind works as well and that he's operating from the influence of the enemy. And we'd say we know that, but when we're really looking at the story and the depth of the collateral damage that happens, we see that the perpetrator is a pawn as well in the grand scheme of this. So any other thoughts about that? We have in the comments, Sister um, V. Charles says, they have to have the mind of Christ to behave differently. And I agree with you. This is where the Lord tells us that we have to do what renew our minds. And we see that the mind of Mr. M was so challenged that he told a 14 year old girl, I had the surgery, which she doesn't know what that means, but the desires are still there. She didn't know what that meant. All right. And we have another comment here. Mr. M knowing that this child loved him, put fear in her by telling her she would be killed by her father or found or or found out and and so i think i think that that's really an important piece to look at is that even though mr m was perpetrating he was having her bear the burden of what was what she was experiencing that's a very good point anyone else yeah on, on that last point i think a lot of us uh, we, we know that victims of, of, of sexual assault are often, and it's almost natural, um, they, they automatically blame themselves. And in the case of Sarah, when the person goes the extra mile in an attempt to cover their track and make you feel that if you allow this to come into the light, there's an extra guilt because something is going to happen to me. Now, this love that this young lady ended up having for Mr. M uh, it was not natural at all. He, to use the word that we've been using, he groomed it. He, he made, he used words, he used opportunity to get her, and I don't even want to use the word fall in love with her, but that's the term I'm going to use, feel a certain way about her, because we know that's not love. Right. He made her feel a certain way about her, and then once he was done, he's going to discard of her 
but he has to do it in a manner to make sure that he's never discovered. And part of that is creating that fear. Uh, and, and by the way, uh, it's interesting because even though he discarded of her at some point, the friendship was never fully cut. And you right. have to think why. There's a right. lot happening here, but I don't want to get ahead of our a moderator. Uh, but absolutely, this was this was this was done by a master. Absolutely, thank you so much. Um, and and Pastor, if you're saying that your volume needs to be a little louder. Some people can't hear. And I believe that there's um, a connection with the Ammon and Mr. M story in the sense of both of these men were in a place where they had a sense of entitlement, that control and power over um, their victims. For Ammon, as soon as he got what he wanted, there was no that desire all of a sudden, this, this, this love that made him so sick and, and all of these things he was feeling disappeared immediately. And he, he hated her as much as he supposedly loved her at the time. At the end of the day, many of these, these um, perpetrators, it's about power, it's about control, it's about this is what I want. And it's a numbing of the mind and a dimming of the eyes to see just how much the enemy is leading you down this path. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that. Um, just so, not just power and control, but mm -hmm. I think opportunity. Mm -hmm. They both yeah. had the opportunity to do what they were able to do. And part of the conversation that we need to have is particularly when we're dealing with our children, and it's not just children because anyone can be a victim here, how do we limit the opportunities for certain people to become uh, victimized by someone like Mr. M? Right, I think that's a great, that's a, a, a great question. How do we limit that? Um, Amanda, I see you coming on. Did you wanna say something? Yeah, if I wanna just go back to the, the, the prior to the, the latest question. If in fact, Mr. M was himself a victim of sexual abuse, we're just assuming that he may have been, there's a strong mm -hmm. possibility, right? And mm -hmm. I'm not excusing his behavior at all. When you are introduced to your sexuality in a very unhealthy manner, you repeat the abuse and you repeat the abuse in an effort to correct it or to normalize it or both. And it doesn't absolve you from your responsibility to be responsible and to not perpetrate on somebody else. But there's a mindset and there's a psychological condition that, that tells you, I have to fix it. And the only way I have to fix it is by repeating it over and over again. If you look at girls especially, or even boys as well, who were sexually abused as children, they usually engage in years of promiscuity and then they live to regret it because they're trying to correct the experience. They're trying to normalize the experience. So if in fact, he was a victim of sexual abuse, that may explain why he used that power differential because that was used probably in his case to, um, to perpetrate on this child. Again, not excusing his behavior. He had the agency to do better. He had the mindset to do better. But this, this demonic psychological uh, phenomena usually is prominent in the minds of people who've been sexually abused. It twists their whole sense of mm -hmm. reality and their whole sense of what's, what's real and what's healthy and what's normal. So if, and I underscore if, he was abused, then that would not explain his behavior or excuse his behavior, but that could be a clinical piece that we are missing. Absolutely. It is a clinical piece to, to, to it. Um, you know, the, the psycho-spiritual piece that, you know, the enemy is always going after the mindset and twisting it to do things that people hadn't even intended on having in their life path. Uh, Tiffany, I see that you have your hand up. Please go ahead. 
Good evening and happy Sabbath. Thank you for this conversation. I have an I wonder. I wonder how this story of, you know, Sarah's life would have changed or played out differently had her mother intervened after reading the note. Um, you know, and that makes a connection with me even to when children are infants and strangers want to touch them. Children cannot advocate for themselves and say, stop, please don't touch. That's why parents are there to protect children. And her mom, had she confronted her child at that point to say, listen, let's unpack this. And I do believe one of the brothers did mention the relationship and communication between Sarah and her parents, which is very important. Had mom intervened, I wonder how this would have played out differently. Thank you. That is a very good point. I wondered that too. Why didn't the mother say anything? Uh, and it it her 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 diary didn't indicate that she used his name. So we don't know if it was, although it was to him, if she identified him, but you're right. I wonder what it would have been like. Now we have some comments that are pretty much um, similar in the chat. Um, one of them says, to entertain the thought that the perpetrator is also a victim, am I to entertain leniency towards the individual? And here is another question very much like it. I'm getting the impression that if the perpetrator is a victim, it's okay, or he or she is justified. God gave us choices. Um, so what do you all think about, about that? Is the perpetrator a victim too? Does it matter if the perpetrator was sexually abused or not? So what, what do you say? Are perpetrators victims? Well, in, in my mind, there's no question that it's, it's important for us to, to try to understand uh, why the Mr. M's of the world do what they do. Um, and um, what we have seen and what we have understood based on a lot of research, as um, um, the uh, other panelists mentioned, it is very likely, even though we don't have that fact, that Mr. M was sexually abused himself. And I think the word that I love that, that she used was, in his repeating this abuse to other people, he's trying to normalize it in his own mind. And that's extremely important for us to understand. Having said that, it, is, it must be clear for everyone to, her, to hear, and I think that was already mentioned, it in no way whatsoever, zero way, justify what he had done. Absolutely, he should have been able to get the help that he needed. I think he's sophisticated enough to understand that he should not, that's not the approach you try to use to normalize it. So absolutely, the people who are victimized by him should not give him a pass because he was himself a victim, assuming that he was. But in trying to understand why did he do what he did, we need to see that there is a cycle here. And from a, uh, a, a religious perspective, a spiritual rather perspective, not religious, spiritual perspective, when I'm dealing with the Mr. M's, because if Mr. M ever comes to me and confesses what he has done, right? Then uh, while I am feeling a certain way about what he did, I need to try to see him from the lens of how God sees him, right? And the way God sees him is a sinner just like me who's going to counsel with him right now, even though I did nothing like he did, but I'm a sinner just like him who needs to be saved. Now, should there be some level of consequence? Are there action that needs to be taken to remedy this? Absolutely. We can have that conversation some other time, but we need to also acknowledge that he is, he probably is, let me just use that, probably is a victim first and unfortunately, Sarah is a victim second. Correct. I, I I underscore that. And but I think it's very hard in these situations to embrace um 
people that are victims in this way. This morning in Sabbath school, we were touching a little bit on this. And, you know, one of the things that I brought up is that when the prodigal son's father saw him cresting the hill, he was positioned looking for that prodigal. And he didn't think about how many women he'd slept with, how much money he spent, how many men he'd slept with, if that was what he was doing in the far country. He didn't think about what he had done to him by wanting him to be dead so that he could have his birthright ahead of time. He just embraced his prodigal. And so I think that that is a really important piece for us to, to think about. The fact that this is not an easy topic. Um, these people that are struggling with this issue, they're struggling with something that God needs to help them remedy. I'll go on to read a few other comments here that says, I don't think that the perpetrator is a victim because he knew the feeling that it gives. So uh, when he put someone else through that trauma um, and then someone else said, I would say yes, for someone to have that kind of mindset, it's possible that he had been sexually abused. And we don't know what the problem is. We don't know if he was sexually abused or not. What we do know is the behavior is a demonically influenced behavior. Um, someone else says he should get psychological help to get over his pain and abuse that he may have endured. Someone else says, isn't that where the church is conflicted? We tell the victim, the we tell the victim the perpetrator is a sinner, just like you, so that it helps to normalize the behavior. Um, that's a very good point. Are we normalizing the behavior? I I am going to say I don't think that we're normalizing the behavior. I think we're normalizing sin. And we're, we're recognizing that sin is a challenge that we all have. And so we're looking at this man who is struggling with this behavior. Some sinful behaviors are more evident, like the story of Sarah and Mr. M, because we know the story, but we don't know. And, and, and I hope that this doesn't make anyone uncomfortable. How many Mr. M's are on this call? How many Sarah's are sitting in the congregation? We don't know, but we love and care for the people that are in our church. And even if we have them sitting in our congregation and on this call, aren't they worthy of redemption just like us? It, there, was a, there was a hand well, up. Yeah, go ahead, Pastor. I just, like, just, I just wanted to say, while clearly we're not normalizing the behavior, I think we need to be very sensitive to the fact that the language that I just used and saying that I recognize that he's a sinner just like any other sinners, mm -hmm. very easy for someone who was victimized by Mr. M to say, look, we are normalizing it. It sounds like we are. And this right. is where we need to be very sensitive and careful in the way we use words uh, because it might send a very bad message to the folks who have been victimized by the Mr. M's of this world. So thank you so much for making that statement. No, we are not, but we understand where it's coming from. That is correct. That is correct. Someone else says, um, uh, we're not normalizing the behavior. We're trying to understand it so that we can help. And that is true. This is a very tender topic. It's not something that we've talked about in the church very often. We see it written in the, in the Holy Scriptures, but really we haven't spent a whole lot of time figuring out what does this mean to us in the church? How, how, how do we recognize it and address it? And someone says, well, where do the authorities come in? And so I think that no one here is saying that there shouldn't be consequences. I think that everyone is agreeing that there should be consequences for the behavior. But I also think that it's important that consequences for the laws of this land are not the only thing that that person needs. I think that you were trying to say something, um, Brother Shippy. Yes, I, I, I just wanted to mention that looking at the the story of Sarah, the 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 backdrop is a sort of middle class 
family environment, you know, from, from the reading it, it appears. Um, but generally most of these, the, the, that points to the fact that this kind of um, behavior takes place at all strata of society, rich, poor, poverty stricken, all levels. You, you, you find this, this, this happening. But generally, you find the, the victims are usually um, chil um, children or, or young people from the, the, the lower um, economic strata of society. And they are more severely affected than because here's Sarah, she went to college, right? But generally, these kinds of actions cause academic and learning problems for, for the, the victim. Um, behavioral problems, sexual problems, low self-esteem and poor self-image, anxiety and other serious problems that pre prevent these victims from 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 reaching their full potential, so so it's 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 a real serious issue here. And with the family, the mistrust and the dysfunction, and and all the other things. And then, of course, we already mentioned that society is 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 severe. So there are victims everywhere you look. There is there are victims from behavior like this. Thank you very much. That is that is so very true. Someone is yes. saying in the comments, in her innocence, Sarah became a victim. We as SDAs have workshops on everything. Shouldn't we also have workshops for our young school kids to help them become aware of dangers ahead that, may, that they may not be aware of? Thank you for that. Yes. Um, um, Elder Barry, Sister Sergeant Barry. Yes, I, I just wanted to quickly address what's seemingly the elephant in the room as to what should have been done, what should be done if something like this is brought to the forefront and we are aware of this kind of abuse. Um, not because I'm in law enforcement, uh, but yes, this is something that would definitely be reported to the authorities. The proper channels need to be taken to make sure that uh, Mr. M um, is, is, is addressed in a manner which that, that suits what he did, right? Um, I don't want anyone in uh, on, on this workshop to believe that we're, we're just going to love him through it and, and try to self um, rehabilitate him. That is not our position. Um, he, he does have to go through the process. He does have to be arrested. He does have to face his crime. Um, we're saying that we need to also still love him through that process, right? Understand that this is a sin like all sins are. Right. And that right. we serve a loving savior that has um, given us grace. So although we might extend grace and try to understand the the dynamics or what brought him to this point, it does not neg neg negate or excuse the actions or um, should it be a Band-Aid cover up for the actions? It has to be addressed. Right. And um, looking at the Tamar story, that's an example of something that was not handled the way it should have been handled. Exactly. Once it was brought to light, her father should have handled it. Right. But but it was swept uh, under the rug. She was kind of pushed to, to the side and it developed a cancer that grew within the family. Um mm -hmm cause discord. So yes, we must love, but there are consequences to our actions. And we know that. Absolutely. And can I just mention and just to quickly follow up sure. on that, that all the employees of that institution, that school, mm -hmm. or any caregiver 
of that child have a responsibility to report their suspicion of any kind of abuse. And the law requires that in Florida, that suspicions of abuse be reported by calling 1-800-96-ABUSE. Uh, uh -huh. Because um, professionals will investigate it. So the folks in the school, the other teachers in that school, they all have a legal responsibility and, and it's a third degree felony to fail to report. So, so that's another part of it that, and then when we get into our churches with youth groups and pathfinders and, and, and all the activities that go on in the church with, with um, youth, the training and the awareness, structured, organized, training programs and awareness programs for volunteers and people who work with children and all officers of the church. For example, the verified volunteer, you, you know, pro, um, screening program must be done by all officers in the church. And then you need to have active monitors, monitors, monitoring. So there there are opportunities to to be be to heighten awareness and to help to prevent this by how we operate institutions. Thank you so much for that, uh, Brother Sheppy. Um, I want us to move on to another very important question, and the question is: Is sexual impropriety a weapon of spiritual warfare? Is sexual impropriety a weapon of spiritual warfare? What do you think? Yes. Mm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you for that quick answer. Anyone else? Your thoughts? Um, someone is saying it it um it depends. Okay. All right. In the chat. All right, Amanda, you came back on. Were you going to say something? Yeah, it is absolutely a weapon of spiritual warfare. If you look at the culture that we are inheriting right now, where sexual impropriety is normalized and legitimized and affirmed, it is a spiritual warfare. We are not fighting here against flesh and blood. We are fighting against spiritual wickedness in high places. So sexual impropriety, doesn't matter what the tone it takes or the context, it is a spiritual warfare. I mean, just right. again, just look at the society and look at what we are dealing with. Mm -hmm. Look at what we as clinicians and teachers and healthcare providers and look at what we're dealing with. And we, we have to attach a spiritual deficit to our current cultural presentations. Thank you so much, Amanda. All right. Um, Prime SDA Church, I see a hand up. Yes, good evening. I was just thinking that um, while Sarah was not able to advocate for herself, for all the reasons that we already spoke about, mm -hmm. while all the other people, there are signs I'm sure that she was exhibiting that nobody picked up on, neither in her family or at school, isolating herself, um, trying to cover for the principal, and stuff like that. Are there signs that we are missing to advocate for people who won't advocate for themselves? Absolutely. So I, I think that that is a very, very good point. And I think that that's why further education, that's why opening up with this conversation today is so important because we recognize that we have to have other types of education around this for what to look for, for how to pay attention to our young people, how to pay attention to each other as adults, because this issue is very much, as the pastor said, operating in the shadows. And so we need to be able to understand what we're seeing in the shadows 
And so I do think that this just says that there's more that we need to do um, as a church body. Madam Moderator, uh, on this particular question that was asked, um, it's fascinating, right? This is what I call the magician trick, right? Mm. Um, the magician tells you, okay, look, look. And while you're focusing on what he or she wants you to look at, mm -hmm. what you don't see is what's happening over there. Exactly. Unless, of course, we are paying attention and we are looking for it we could be missing the signs that are right in front of us. So when the moderator mentions, uh, Dr. Bradford mentions educating, that becomes a big part of, of solving this problem. But here's something else that I don't want us to go into a, a different direction, but it seems as though Sarah's mom had a clear sign, at least there, see, that something was wrong. And you know what comes to my mind? I have no evidence of it. I would not be surprised, and I know there's a lot of ifs happening here, right. that this triggered something for her that she did not want to address. Absolutely. Because maybe she was a victim herself. And so when she reads the letter, the, not that she does not love her daughter, but the best thing she could do to, to protect herself from the trauma that she endured is to walk away from it. So again, you know, there's a lot of ifs happening here, but to go back to your original question, we need to be trained to see the signs. And when we see the sign, we need to be open and willing to speak on them. Absolutely. I think that point is well taken, that there is a lot of unattended sorrow that people are bringing to church every week and sitting in the pews with every week. You know, we have wounds that are traveling wounds that have traveled with us from childhood all the way through your 80th and 90th year on this earth. And I think that it's really important to um, understand that age does not erase a wound that has been unattended. And so I think that that is a really important topic for us to, um, to consider as we move forward. I see another hand and Perrine, please go ahead. Hi, good evening. My name is Hyson Smart. Hello, Ms. Smart. Yes. I sit here and just, just listening to what you're saying and mm -hmm. uh, it might not be happening here in the United States of America. Mm -hmm. okay but let me say this it has been plagued in the united kingdom mm -hmm. now um i heard pastor said that the mother must have seen signs but maybe chose mm -hmm. to ignore mm -hmm. now i am speaking factual mm -hmm. not what i say we had a situation in one of our churches over there, and it was the father to the daughter. Mm -hmm. And the daughter complained to the mother. But the father was an elder. The mother was in Sabbath school, and it was so shameful that she could not face the music of what was going on. Mm -hmm. And so, it went on for years and eventually the girl was getting older and she couldn't stand the situation anymore. So she told another church member mm -hmm. and the church member was the one that blew it out of proportion. Mm -hmm. Now the church was found guilty because we understood later on that it was reported to the pastor and he decided to keep it as a hush hush hmm. because it would have brought disgrace in the church hmm. mm -hmm. and i could go on hence in england every officer have to be crb screened mm -hmm. every officer in the seventh day adventist church in england have to you call it background screening here they have to be crb there especially those that are dealing with children 
-hmm. And if anything is found, then that person is devoted, demoted from ministry. Mm -hmm. Let me also hasten to say, I praise God that I have not been a victim because I would die. Mm -hmm. As soon as it is over, I would just die. <laughs> You're laughing? I am dead serious. I beg God every day because I know I would just, well, before it happened, I would just die. Mm -hmm. But I have got a niece that was abused from the age of seven to 13. Mm -hmm. And she's 67 years old and she's still suffering the consequence. So this is not something to play with. And she told her mother. And the mother said she thought she was just being a bad child. Mm -hmm. Because she was just running around and in the end, she ended up in a foster home. So parents have good relationship with your children that anything that is happening out there, they are not afraid to come home and say, somebody touch me. Mm -hmm. Even in the church and brethren, um, moderator, sorry, I hope I'm not taking too much time, but listen, there are times when we do a little bit too much exposure. And so we invite intruders let us be cautious about that. Thank you so much, my sister. Um, it is a very tender topic and something that, as I said earlier, that needs very sensitive educating um, in our communities, in our homes. Um, I see that uh, Brother Leonard Davis's hand is up. Please go ahead, Brother Davis. Yes, uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. Sure. sure. Um, you didn't mention uh, earlier that uh, is this a type of spiritual warfare? Mm -hmm. And whatever the devil can use to attack the institutions of God, he will use and will continue to use. Um, at the same time, I think this this today's or uh, this week's lesson talks about wisdom, mm -hmm. and it, it is one thing um, going through all of these lessons and the Word of God and not being able to, with wisdom, deal with the situation for, for the solution. Um, the, 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 um, the, the wrath of God you know, is being revealed and people in these situations, if they continue in these behavior situations, there comes a point where you know, God's protection is, is, is withdrawn from them. We call them the, the victim as well. But, um, all these are signs that God's desire, God's plan for each of us individually is being attacked and being neglected. And it, when we are not living in harmony with the will of God, then the devil will use all these weapons um, to, to attack um, the, the family and the church. Um, first, Second Corinthians 10, 4 tells us that the weapons of our warfare um, are not carnal, are not worldly. They are, you know, using wisely the, the 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 institution of the word of God because that's that's all we have to we have to live by. Um, Christ says, if if we want to go to we want to see God and go go into His kingdom, the the the, the solution is to know God, and it takes that kind of wisdom to know God. The 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 the, 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 the when you send your children to the school, whether it's public school or church school, or to church or to any environment, they are being exposed to you don't know what. But um, somebody mentioned the responsibilities. Um, the, the home environment has to prepare them, uh, build them around the, the, uh, in, in a devotional atmosphere or mindset that they can provide a level of protection. Um, we we don't just get up each day and just barge into the world. The devil is preparing and planning for us just nakedly. But there has to be preparation, parents and children. Um, we talk about wolves in sheep's clothing. There are also sheep who are able 
to desire to, to discern and see what's happening and provide protection. They have to be awakened out of their sleep um, to be to be on guard for everyone that surround them. We have to be be to, to be vigilant to see where the danger is and to be able to warn and protect. Use the word of God wisely in our lives. And that is what God expects us to, uh, to, to, to use, especially in these last days. We see the church is becoming more and more like the world. And we, uh, as a church, needs to be becoming more and more dependent on the word of God and find protection and solution there. Thank you so much, my brother. I do appreciate that. Um, I see another hand for Perrine. I just want to say before that person speaks that we are getting close to the end of our time today. Um, and I just want to speak to the point of the sister that uh, shared earlier um, at Perrine and said that she would just die. And I want to to if you forget everything that we've said today, you cannot forget this that when this happens, something inside of everyone that knows it and has experienced it dies. Now, just really think about that because the, the devil, yes, he wants us to do the big death, but he doesn't have a problem with killing us off by degrees also. And so when we, when we find that we're addressing this issue, a little something in us dies. We're always kind of looking over our shoulder, always wondering if we're safe. All right? There's there's that there's that peace that passes understanding that the devil starts to kill off inch by inch. And so I think that that's really important for us to understand the collateral damage of this, as I had said earlier. Yes, there's another hand in Perrine. Please speak. Good evening, everyone. So there's so much to unpack. However, um, we have to recognize that all of us are walking around with unhealed trauma. Yes. Um, in various forms. And the reason why we don't address the areas of these things is because we haven't dealt with our own personal trauma. And I can tell that sometimes we're saying that Mr. M um, he, you know, he didn't deserve grace or mercy or he, he should have known better. He himself has unhealed trauma. We're all unwhole. And it's only the God of heaven that can make us whole. Amen. To walk and operate with sound mind. That's right. Because if you have a sound mind, you will never entertain these actions. Um, unfortunately, the unhealed trauma has been generational. Mm -hmm. Our parents, our grandparents, our great grandparents, you name it, and on and on. Um, because of things that are have happened to them, they haven't been able to handle it, and they go to the opposite direction. Mm -hmm. They handle us in a negative way. You know, there have been young people who cannot even address their their mother about their <clears throat> excuse me their menstrual cycle because they haven't themselves haven't been poured into to understand that's a natural process. You know, sex, the conversation about sex, the, the conversation about purity and love, all of those things is a generational cycle. If everyone understands what I'm saying, it's like. Some of us haven't been given that. And so we, it, it, it causes us to go on to the next generation and we meet a partner and we accept certain things and things of that nature. So it's a cycle and a continuous cycle of what the enemy wants to keep us in bondage to. Right. And we need to stop with the silence. We need to stop with the shame. We need to stop with the un, um, judgment and educate ourselves you know that um what sister smart was talking about the same situation happened um to a young woman a pastor took mm -hmm. a 19 year old woman whose parents died in a car accident he groomed mm -hmm. her as well mm -hmm. it was a big thing yeah and all they did was transfer him mm -hmm. so we need to start educating ourselves asking God for healing 
for the wholeness that we all need so we can support each other. Because even people like Mr. M needs healing. He needs wholeness as well. I need healing. You need healing. We need God's wholeness as well as we journey through this Christian life. Because the flaws of others should not affect you mm -hmm. from not loving Christ. Right. You got to know Christ for yourself so the flaws of others won't distract you from Christ. Amen. Thank you so much. Um, so um, as we end today, and it's very hard to end this, right? Because it feels like we're just warming up to this topic because this is this is a fledgling topic in, in our church, in our congregation. But I just want to say that we are all victims, just to underscore what my sister just said, we are all victims of soul trauma, right? You know, in the three angels messages, one of them says, and I'm just going to quote a little part of it, that he has made all nations drink from the wine of the wrath of fornication. Now, I speak on this topic. I'm not going to go into it too deeply, but I'm going to say made means force, right? Um, drinking means losing your clear mind, your wise mind, right? Fornication means forced rape and wrath means it's beyond anger. And so when we recognize that this is part of uh, the third angel's message, we realize that we're all we're all really functioning on some level of soul trauma. And so, no, we're not condoning Mr. M, but we're saying he has a soul trauma. And sometimes people's soul trauma perpetrates in a way that is so uh, beyond what any of us would think that we would do. But do we have soul traumas when we take an extra piece of cake when we shouldn't? when we're angry at someone that's sitting in church next to us and we have resolved in our mind that our sacred contract is that we're never going to like that person ever. And we take every opportunity that we can to tear that person down. Are we Mr. M2 in our own right? So no, we're not saying that what he did was something that we can condone, but what he did is something that we're all struggling with, some form of psycho-spiritual trauma. Okay, I see one more hand in Perrine, and um, we're going to end with that one person, unfortunately, and then we're gonna have, after this, uh, the pastor will give uh, closing remarks. Please go ahead with the hand. Someone in Perrine? person seemed to have changed their mind. Madam. Okay. All right. Well, um, let me just thank you all for participating today. I'm hoping that this conversation cannot, cannot just stay as a special AY program. This conversation needs to be part of our breath because it is part of the war. And so I just want to thank all of you for sharing today. Uh, we didn't get into every single question uh, that was in the chat or every comment, but I just am going to ask that this conversation continue and not in the hushed way of, did you hear this? Or did you hear that? Or that girl is fast? Or did you see the length of her skirt? Or not that. I'm asking that you take the opportunity when you see things to deepen your relationship with Christ around that issue and stop trying to shake your finger in people's faces and tell them what they should do and what they shouldn't do. And instead, learn how to put an arm around someone and say, this may not be my issue, but I have issues too. And so I just want to encourage us to embrace the lyrics of that song and they'll know we are Christians by our love. Thank you, Pastor. Well, thank you so very much. Uh, I just want to take this opportunity as we close to um, uh, openly, I think I'm speaking for all of us, uh, thank Dr. Brathwaite for being so ably moderating this um, important conversation. We thank you so very much. We're hoping that uh, at least for us here at Perrine, it's at uh, the beginning of a conversation that we will continue to have. Um, I'm looking forward to it. Uh, we'll create an atmosphere and a platform for us to have that conversation. Um, the last words that I want to share with you is 
the spirit of prophecy, a servant of God mentioned that if we are able to control and have victory over our appetite, there is no other sin that we cannot have victory over. Amen. Let me see the way I translate this. If we can have victory over the desires of the flesh, mm. then everything else we will have the power to become victorious over. Mm. Sexual sin, it's a desire of the flesh, but it has emotional, psychological, and spiritual impact. Why? Because we all understand this, we are all spiritual beings. Mm -hmm. Impossible then for something like that not to impact us at the deepest level, which mm -hmm. is spiritually. So as we journey uh, for the next uh, few weeks, the next few months, the next few years, and continue to have these conversation, it is my prayer that even now the Lord will begin to heal those of you who have been impacted by this. And what we have learned today is uh, you are not the sole victim. Mm -hmm. Everybody in your circle of influence is being victimized by what was done to you. So we are praying for you. And yes, we are even praying for the person who caused you so much pain. With that, I'm going to stand and I'm going to invite you uh, to please stand with me for our closing prayer. Most kind and heavenly father, we just want to thank you once again for this important conversation that uh, you allowed us to have. Uh, Father, we recognize that uh, within uh, this room and within uh, the walls of this uh, virtual platform, there are hundreds and thousands who are hurting badly. Uh, some we have agreed, we have uh, 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 said, have been journeying with that pain for the last 50, 60, 70 years. Um, and today we are saying, help us to break the chains. We're saying that we are surrendering it all to you. We're saying that we want to encounter you in a way so that you can champion this thing for us because we need the deliverance that only you can provide. Father, we pray in a very special way that uh, you will intervene in the life of that one person who feels right now like they cannot go another day with the hurt and the pain that they are feeling right now. Intervene in their lives in a very mighty way. I pray that you will send someone. I pray that this conversation that we just had uh, will help them to begin the healing process so that one day uh, they can help others. We thank you for what you've already done. We thank you for the members of this panel, and we thank you for what you're getting ready to do in our lives. All these things we ask and pray, not because we have merits, Oh boy, we have none, but we ask in the loving name of our of your son, our big brother, our Lord and our Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen and amen. God amen. Bless. Um, Pastor, I'm just gonna put up the slide again with the resources for anyone that missed them so that they can take a picture of it if they need to. Absolutely. Slide is going up on the screen. Uh, important resources for you to have. And even with you, you don't think that you're going to need it right now. I think it's worth having something like that. Uh, and I'm going to age myself in your Rolodex. Amen, somebody. Uh, yeah. so that uh, uh, If and when it's ever necessary, either for yourself or someone else, you can share that information with them. Yes. Hello, everyone. I just want to say thank you to Coconut Grove, to Mission Station, to all of you who came out and those of you who are online. On behalf of Prime Seventh-day Adventist Church and everyone else, thank you. And as the pastor said, and as we're seeing, there's so much that is happening in our church and we have all been impacted in some, some way. So let us be mindful of that and take time, take care of each other and know to be kind and make this a safe space for everyone, right? Okay, for those of you who are leaving, there's refreshments outside for you. Those of you who are staying, there will be refreshments hopefully after our business meeting and thank you again. Take care. Thank you, Dr. Brathwaite for all you're doing. All right, folks, uh, for the members of the Perrine Seventh-day Adventist Church, 715 sharp, 
a business meeting will start, so you have exactly about 20 minutes, give or take.